Well, uh, according to a lot of different news uh, stations, uh, one of the common, most common phrases that, that we've heard is that, can you believe it's December already? And so uh, also, I also can't imagine, I can't believe that it's already December. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there are many of us in this room that, are, that is very eager for 2022 to be over with and to start fresh uh, in the new year. I'm one of those people also. Uh, because maybe for, for some of you, 2022 was a, a very difficult uh, year. And um, we would love to have a restart or a do-over. Um, over time, maybe your homes are like this. Uh, it's been quite messy. You've you accumulated a lot of junk in your house this past year, all because of the Black Friday sales and the Cyber Monday sales. And, and so you've maybe done a lot of purchasing. There's a lot of Amazon boxes in your house. Come on, somebody. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in your house. And, and maybe you just feel cluttered and overwhelmed um, and would love to do a massive cleaning. Um, and if you don't realize by now, our souls uh, can be the same way. It can feel the same way. And because 2023 is only a few weeks away, uh, believe it or not, I, I want to prepare all of us uh, each year for what we do uh, at the start of the new year. And uh, we'll be doing a 21-day corporate fast. And a corporate fast means that we are all doing it. It's not just one person or on your own, doing your own thing, but we are all doing it together. And uh, for some of you, this will be maybe the first time that you've ever done something like this. Uh, maybe you've never fasted in your life. Maybe you've fasted only like half a day or one meal. Um, but uh, maybe fasting for 21 days seems so intimidating, so overwhelming, so almost impossible. And the answer is, yes, it is impossible. And that's why we uh, go through something like that, so for we can experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through being dependent upon him. And uh, um, so uh, I don't know how you think about fasting. Uh, maybe some of you think it's a very extreme thing to do, uh, that only extremists do that. But hopefully, as we saw last week, Fasting was a regular practice of Jesus and his followers. That fasting is a regular, normal thing for, the follower, for a follower of Jesus. It's because fasting reminds us that we can get by with most things in our lives for a time, uh, but then we cannot ultimately uh, get by without God. And so our first purpose of doing this fast is to draw closer to God. Uh, I think if you've had some experience fasting, uh, what initiates a fast is because you want, so, you want God to do something for you. You, want, you fast because maybe you want prayer to be answered. And, but we don't fast for, for our prayers to be answered, though typically that does happen. But we are fasting to know God and to hunger and thirst for his righteousness, which in turn makes us more aware that God is answering our prayers on a daily, regular basis. And what is prayer? Prayer is fellowship and relationship with God. And so what fasting does is it deepens our relationship with God. Do you see how this works? That when we fast, we, we begin to break the barriers of our flesh and that, that stand in opposition to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, uh, that stands in opposition to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when these barriers are, are, are dismissed and eradicated, the Holy Spirit can work even more unhindered through our prayers and through our lives. The word fasting from Hebrew, uh, it comes from the word which means distress or loss of appetite during time of danger or threat. Uh, it comes from the word of, of, of losing your appetite during a time of danger or threat. I want you to imagine if, if maybe this has happened in your life, or, but if not, maybe I want you to imagine that, that you heard that your, one of your parents was in a, in a car accident and uh, was in the emergency room at the hospital, what would you do? What would you do in that situation? Well, I think most of us would rush to the hospital, drop everything, and rush to the hospital. But what if it was lunchtime? What if it was 12 noon and, and you hadn't had lunch? Uh, would you stop by McDonald's and go through the drive through and pick up uh, 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 chicken nuggets and pick up a Big Mac or something on the way to the hospital? No, that would, that would be crazy thinking. That would be just, just really just really insane. Because for the most part, most of us, at the news of an emergency, at the news of, of something like that, we want to rush to be with our loved one. We want to go be with them as fast as possible. We want to see what is going on uh, with them. Um, and we would forego our hunger to be with your loved one as soon as possible, if that makes sense. And that's what's happening at the beginning of the year when we fast, and we're calling a corporate fast. 
And there are tons of examples. Queen Esther called a corporate fast because uh, uh, the people of Israel was under, under siege and under persecution. So she called a corporate fast. And so when there was an emergency, there was a corporate fast. And what I'm asking us to do as a, as a family, as a congregation, is to, is to do a corporate fast for 21 days to forego our hunger so that we can be with our loved one as soon as possible. That for a season of time that we are going to forego our hunger because our mind and our hearts desire to be consumed and want more of God in our lives. And uh, the truth be told that fasting is quite a sacrifice. Uh, I, I don't think I need to tell you that. It is quite a sacrifice that... Um, Maybe if, if you're sitting here and you're debating in your mind whether you, you're going to fast, because I know every year that happens. When, when, when the Sunday we begin, uh, some of us are so last minute and we're like, oh, should I fast, should I not fast? You know, I was going to, but now I'm, I'm you know, getting cold feet and I'm chickening out. Well, if, if, if you are having these thoughts running through your mind, uh, you might be thinking, well, you know, I think fasting is a good thing. You know, if I fast, I might lose some weight, you know, and uh, if I fast social media, then I'll gain some more time. So it's not a bad thing. Um, but when we have those kinds of thoughts, then fasting becomes all about us. It becomes about our self-improvement. Yeah, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to have more time. It's, 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 it becomes all about us. But the heart of fasting is sacrifice. And sacrifice is oriented towards worship unto God. Because if you don't realize this, that sacrifice is worship. Sacrifice is worship. Turn to your neighbor and say, sacrifice is worship. Sacrifice is worship. If you remember in the Old Testament, when they wanted to worship God, what did they do? They brought a sacrifice to the altar. They burned it. They brought their own animal of wealth. That, you know, they brought their money. They brought their animals of their own, and they brought it, and they consumed it, and for, for many of us who are, want to be really efficient with our, our finances, it's like, man, that, that is such a waste, man. We could have had that, that, uh, that cow for some just great steak, and, and we're just giving it up, and we're sacrificing. It's because we're worshiping the Lord and sacrifice. We bring a sacrifice, and sacrifice is worship. And so when we begin to fast, it is a sacrifice. It is worship unto the Lord. Can a brother get an amen? And so what we're doing is we're giving up a good thing whether it be food, whether it be social media, whether it be coffee, whatever. whatever. We're giving up a good thing in exchange for a better thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, all right. Amen all by myself. We're, exchange, we're giving up a good thing in exchange for a better thing. As we've been saying all along, to give up the legitimate pleasures of this world in exchange for the extraordinary pleasures of God. That... The, 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 the amazing thing that uh, I don't think you may have thought about, but when we fast, it is a way to experience God not through our intellect, not through a sermon, not through a podcast or reading a book, but we get to experience God through our bodies. That for the most part, our Christian lives, we experience God through, through a sermon or through a book or through a podcast or, or something, that we've experienced God with our intellect with our thoughts. But fasting is a way that you can experience God with your body. Um, fasting is a core spiritual practice. As I mentioned last week, Jesus mentions only three spiritual practices, and fasting is one of them. Giving, uh, prayer, and fasting. It's one of them. And uh, what's interesting, it, it, it all starts back in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, everything starts back in the Garden of Eden. The, what, what happened? What was the temptation? It was to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It was to eat. It was this resistance. It was this temptation to, to eat food. And what we've learned is that there seems to be a reciprocal relationship with our level of self-discipline with food as there is with self-discipline with sin. That if, there, if you are able to discipline yourself, your flesh, from food, you are stronger and able to discipline yourself with sin. Thomas Akempis said, restraint from gluttony, if you restrain from gluttony, you shall be more easily restrained from all the inclinations of the flesh. And so uh, if you notice that the less limits we have on our appetites, um, the less, we, the tend we have to be engaged in more of our bodily appetites, whether it be gossip or sex or shopping or, or even violence to the extreme. 
Uh, as you fast, you will notice that your, your desire for sin or your temptations don't go away, but it does go down. It does go down. But you will experience your desire for God goes up because you're so hungry, like, oh, God, help me now. Come, Lord Jesus. And so we begin to start craving more prayer. We begin to start craving other things. And uh, now we're, we're changing our flesh, our body, from being an enemy in this fight against the devil to now becoming an ally. Let me say that again. When we fast, we're beginning to change our bodies from being an enemy of our bodies and the devil in the fight to now using our bodies to be an ally in this fight. I want us to look at a passage in 2 Kings chapter 4 in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, if you could open to 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at a story and see uh, what the principles or the concept is here with Elisha, uh, the apprentice of Elijah the prophet. And uh, verse chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Somebody say empty. Empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars as, as each is filled. Put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her sons, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Uh, we'll stop right there. And so here, uh, to recap what's going on here, here's a widow uh, who came to the prophet Elisha, and she was being threatened with bankruptcy uh, because she couldn't pay her bills. And so the creditor had threatened to throw her two sons uh, into jail to be slaves to his servanthood um, in order to satisfy the, the widow's debt. But she appealed to the prophet Elisha and informed him that she only had a little bit of oil left. And so, watch this, the prophet instructed her to borrow as many empty pots. Somebody say empty. Empty pots that she could find. She was told not to, to borrow pots that were full of stuff or oil, nor did he ask uh, her, her to borrow some oil. She was instructed just to collect some empty pots. Not a few, but as many as possible. And uh, the principle here is that if we want to be filled with, the, with the, the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to come before the Lord with empty pots. But is your pot full or is it your pot empty? And uh, for me, uh, there's a lot of stuff in my pot, in my, in my vessel. There's a lot of junk and garbage. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of thoughts that are, that are not of God. You know, uh, there's a lot of different things that, that are in there. And so when we fast, we begin to empty our pots before the Lord so that he could fill it back in. Uh, Paul in Ephesians says, do not be drunk with wine or beer or, or liquor, but what? Be filled with the Spirit. And so God doesn't put anything in our vessel if it's already filled with something else. I mean, I guess he could do it, but like if it's already full, he'd have to explode the vessel and, and then start all over or something like that. And a lot of times, unfortunately, he does that because we're so full with our stuff that he explodes us in order to create a new vessel that is empty. Do not be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so the first step of emptying our pots is, to, is called repentance, is to go before the Lord and repent of all the things that have filled your soul that is not of God. But the second step to empty our pots is surrender. Repentance, surrender. Repentance, surrender. Lord, I surrender all of this to you. How often in the past six months have we emptied our pots and how often have we repented and surrendered? Repented and surrendered. You've got to get rid of all that earthly stuff to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we empty our pots, the greatest, it is the greatest expression of surrender and humility. 
It's the greatest expression of being able to say to God, not my will, but your will be done. That when we fast and as we empty our pots, it's the greatest expression of being able to say to the Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That it's not just from your words, but it's from your actions. It's from your life. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because your will is better. Your will is better. My will is self-centered, selfish, and destructive. But your will is filled with life and hope and grace. Come on, somebody. Not my will, but your will be done. It's a very basic concept that in order to be filled with something new, you need to empty out your vessel with the existing substance or you need to get a new vessel. You need to get new wineskins. And so as we allow during this fast, and I know it's, it's, it's just four weeks away, it's still a long time, but we, as we go through this fast and we allow our physical body to empty ourselves of food, we make the intentional effort to empty our soul before God and to fill our vessel with himself. There, there are a couple interesting things that you will notice if you actually go through a 21-day uh, food fast, that fasting helps you change your taste. Um, in my experience, um, because I, I hadn't eaten in, in 21 days or, or 40 days, my taste buds have changed. And so that when I went back to normal food, whether it be like kimchi jjigae or denjang jjigae or any jjigae or jjigae soup, uh, even Pastor Mike knows what I'm talking about, um, all of a sudden, everything was just way too salty. It was just way too oily. It was, my taste buds have changed. And, and, and taste can be developed. Um, you know, most, many of us as kids, uh, we did not like vegetables. And if you did, you were an anomaly. You were weird. You know, what kind of kid loves vegetables, right? I was one of those things. I would never eat broccoli. I would never eat beans especially, right? They, 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 they tasted horrible to me. But as we grow older, and maybe as we get better information in terms of how important and necessary uh, vegetables are for our health, my taste buds have changed. And now I enjoy eating broccoli with a lot of ranch and cheese. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I enjoy eating vegetables now because my taste has changed. I was not a coffee drinker until, um, you know, never through college. These days, kids in high school start drinking coffee, but you know, I never drank coffee even in college. The first time I drank coffee like back to back on, on consecutive days was when I had my child. Because uh, man, there's no sleep going on and I had to find something. I needed a fix of something to keep me awake or you know. Um, and so from that, like I was uh, totally against coffee. Like not because of morality reasons, but because of taste reasons. I always thought, why would anybody want to drink dirt? It looks like dirt. It tastes like dirt. Uh, it, it's, just, it, it's just dirt. Why would you want to drink liquid dirt? Now, I've developed a taste for it, um, and I drink coffee almost every single day. It's just, I don't know what happened. Sushi is like the same way, right? Um, you know, there's some kids these days, because they're so fancy and advanced now, that they enjoy sushi and sashimi, raw fish from the beginning. But most people, you know, it's an acquired taste. And I remember the first time trying to, to, to swallow a raw fish, uh, or chew on it and, and, and eat it, it was just, it was disgusting for me. It was slimy, it was nasty. Now, I cannot live without it. Uh, this, is, this is true information that uh, whenever we want to celebrate a special dinner in honor of me, mostly birthdays, anniversaries, and Valentine's is always, you know, my wife focused. But uh, if, like a birthday dinner, it's very simple. We go to eat sushi. And, and it's because my taste has changed and developed. Uh, I remember our, our son, uh, when he was growing up, we... Uh, only gave him healthy foods, right? So we, we gave him only whole grain and multi-grain bread and, and brown rice and fruits and vegetables and quinoa, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so he never had any junk food. He never had any candy or cookies or ice cream or anything like that. But the first time he had an Oreo cookie, you know where it was? It was at church. It was a church that brought, made his downfall, right? He had never eaten an Oreo cookie until he came to church. And the, and the first time he ever had a, a slice of cake, do you know where that was? That was at church, right? And you know, up to that point, he had never eaten ice cream. I mean, can you imagine that, right? We, we try to be, delay that as much as possible. But you know where he had his first ice cream? It was at church. 
And so the church led to his downfall. Now he's in therapy trying to get healed from that. <laughs> but someone once said that sin is like drinking scalding coffee, that you suddenly lose your ability to taste anything. That sin is like scalding coffee, that you lose your ability to taste anything. So when you fast, you're emptying yourself by giving up food to feed on God, but now you're developing a taste for God. You're developing a, a taste for his presence, that once you taste him, you will want more of him. For Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that he is good. For most of us, our taste of God is, is, is uh, mixed in with the things of this world. And so we think that, man, God is not that powerful. God is not that strong. God is not that great because it's mixed in with, with things of this world. But when you begin to fast and get rid of that taste and develop a new taste for God, you will see in the big things and in the small things that God is good. Woo, come on. You will see that God is good. Many of us are discouraged because of the suffering we're going in. Even in suffering, you will see that God is good. And so we are coming towards God in, 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 as we fast. We're coming towards God. Um, you know, believe it or not, fasting is a life-giving experience. That when you fast, you give your life to your soul and your spirit, and you renew that yourself. Uh, we can fast for physical reasons, like maybe breaking an addiction or, or trying to ask God to meet a financial need or, and, and receive an answer to, to prayer. Of course, those are, those are appropriate. But as I mentioned, we fast to know God. And when we know God, that leads us to rest. How many of us need some rest today? How many of us are, are running on empty? How many of us are burnt out? How many of us are, are fatigued and tired that when you give your soul to God, you will find rest? Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But many people don't consider that you could ever get rest from fasting, right? Instead, we dwell on, on the, the idea that the, the, we're losing strength, that strength is being sapped from our body, and, and pleasure is being denied from our taste buds because we're not eating. But in actuality, the opposite is taking place, that your soul is entering into a place of rest the Lord gives you. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest for your souls. Um, he didn't say that you will find rest from your long work hours. He didn't say that you're going to find rest from your stressful job. But what he did say, but rather you will find rest from struggling with sin. For rest from believing the lies of the devil. Rest from con your condemning conscience. Rest from the guilt and shame that you feel. And rest for your anxious heart. This is the type of rest that Jesus offers us. It's not just a physical rest, fatigue from our stressful lives and stressful jobs and stressful family, but I'll give rest for your souls, rest from an anxious heart, rest from condemnation and guilt and shame, rest for your souls. The primary purpose of fasting is self-humbling, is to humble yourself. Fasting is a scriptural means chosen by God for us to humble ourselves before the Lord. Uh, throughout <clears throat> scriptures, the Lord uh, requires us to be humble before him, that pride goes before a fall. Uh, Matthew 18, 4 says, Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Matthew 23 says, Forever, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's James 4. I want you to notice in all of these scriptures that humbling ourselves is a responsibility placed on us. That if we were to pray, God, would you humble me? That is not a scriptural prayer. That through these passages, God is requiring us to humble ourselves. Uh, fasting is a way that we can do that. King David in Psalm 35 says this, I humbled myself with fasting. That I humbled myself with fasting. Um, and so uh, Paul says in Romans uh, 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, 
but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And if we were to be honest, many of us have lost or are losing our zealousness, our fervency. I mean, is it really possible to, not ever, to never be lacking in zeal? Well, according to Paul, it is. And it is through fasting and prayer that makes a way for it to be possible. You know, uh, I, I was thinking about this <clears throat> recently, about kind of the condition of, of our souls and condition of our church. And, and uh, if we're lacking fervency in prayer, it's one of the first signs that, that we need a fresh awakening, a fresh revelation of who God is, that we need to lift our eyes heavenward to see the beauty and majesty of the Lord. And if you're losing that fervency in prayer, that if we feel like we're beginning to drift through to prayer as an obligation, rather than passionately directing our hearts towards God, then it means that we need to begin to start an initiation of a process through prayer and fasting. It's this desire, it's this prayer, God, I need a renewal, I need an awakening, I need more of you. And so when we fast, it awakens our hunger for God. And so when we shut down our natural appetite, we begin to awaken our hunger and appetite for God. Uh, through the years, I've known uh, several people who are just so surprised at how wonderful and powerful this 21-day fast is, and, and they've even considered and wanted to go even further, and they have gone further, maybe for 40 days. Um, and, and you have to understand that fasting is one of the most powerful weapons we have against the enemy, that we tell the enemy that, that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. There's this common misconception that fasting is only reserved for, for uh, times of crisis. Um, some think that maybe fasting is just an Old Testament thing, that, uh, that it's not relevant for today, but nothing could be further from the truth. As we notice, his, Jesus fasted, his disciples fasted, and all these things. And, and I, I do want to tell you this, that there is a closeness to God that you cannot experience outside of fasting and prayer. That, that there is a greater revelation of who God is as we humble ourselves before the Lord, that we disconnect our distractions through the world. Remember, we talked about that there's no need to, to go to a monastery, to be a monk or a nun, uh, and, and seclude yourself. We can do that here every single day within the normal works of life, within our normal activities. We can fast and disconnect from the distractions of the world and now connect to the power and presence of God. That we will be able to experience a spiritual freshness and newness for our souls. If I could ask the worship team to join me. Um, and so uh, when we want to have that renewal, I, 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 the reason I want us to fast together is because I want us to be in alignment with his spirit that through fasting and prayer corporately that we begin to hear God's voice, that we begin to, to align ourselves with God, that there is unity in this place, that we are filled with his presence and his grace, that we want to see a breakthrough in our lives because we're struggling with so many things. And, and like a mechanic who's able to assess what's wrong with your car, fasting and prayer is able for you, for the Holy Spirit to assess what's wrong with your soul to be able to experience freedom for your soul. Maybe you've done this fast uh, previous years, and, and uh, maybe you had high expectations, but nothing came out of it. Uh, maybe you were just frustrated and stressed out and worried uh, just about your finances at home. And maybe you thought, like, I just don't, I just don't understand why it didn't work. I fasted for 21 days, and, and nothing changed. And unfortunately, this is our, our approach to fasting. But here's what I want to close with. God's intention for fasting is to be a regular lifestyle and a regular part of our lives, just as giving, just as serving, just as prayer, just as reading God's word. Fasting is something that we should do so frequently that it becomes natural and habitual. And if I could challenge you with this question, is fasting a part of your life? Is, a, is it a part of your regular walk with Christ? Because fasting was a, a, a way of life for Jesus himself. And as we've said, if you want to experience the life of Jesus, we need to practice the ways of Jesus. That Jesus came to give us life to its fullest, 
to begin to, to break the chains of oppression over our lives, to begin to bring healing and freedom for our souls, to bring forgiveness and to, bring, uh, uh, to cover all of our shame and guilt. In order to experience the life of Jesus, we need to practice the way of Jesus. And so as we fast, it becomes an expression of our dependence on God and a surrender and submission to his will. And so I, I want to invite you, even though uh, it's a few weeks away, I want you to start praying and preparing yourself for a fast. Um, you know, if you've done this in previous years, consider, really ask the Holy Spirit, what, what, what do you want me to give up today? Do something that you love, give up something that you enjoy, that's legitimate, but something that requires a total dependence upon God, and you will surprise yourself. It will be difficult. It will be hard. It will be challenging. You will get tired. But you will experience the power, the presence, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this year. Every year it's been just powerful, powerful, powerful time for our group. So let me pray with you. Father, even now, I pray that our spirit just hungers and desires for you and more of you. That we are less interested in our situation and our challenges and our struggles, but we're more interested in experiencing you and your grace and your power. For you are holy, you are worthy, you are awesome, you are the first, you are the last, you are the alpha, you are the omega, you are God almighty. And so, Lord, we want to humble ourselves. We want to humble ourselves before you. We bow before you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.